Okay, it's seven o'clock, so we're going to get started. Hello, my name is Matt Bender. I'm a program assistant here at the Schaumburg Township District Library. I would like to welcome you to tonight's program. Um, thank you for being flexible. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for clicking on the new link we sent mere minutes before this program. Um, and I think tonight you're going to have a very unique and special treat. Um, Ray Bradbury is an author that is beloved, not only for his uh, niche in science fiction, but his universal truths and representations in his stories and books that are still read widely today and still have very great resonance um, in our modern society. Uh, we wanted to bring in the new Ray Bradbury Experience Museum uh, that is in Waukegan, Illinois. Uh, they were going to open last year, but I think just like the rest of us, uh, their great plans uh, were thwarted by this pandemic. And so we wanted to give you the chance to see something pretty exclusive, um, a unique museum uh, for a very unique person, uh, Chicago, Chicago area writer, and um, as we're going to learn, comics fan. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say, uh, if you want to check out our website, schomburglibrary.org slash Comic Con, um, you will see the rest of the events we've had for the last two weeks and also our Artists Alley. So if you are missing the marketplace of our in-person Comic Con that we wish we could have had this year, check out our website. The talented artists that you see every year, they're going to be there. By all means, check out what they have to offer. They're very talented. And I know they would like to be here in person if it were safe. Um, so that's enough from me. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you will notice that we have a live transcript going. If you no longer want to see your live transcript, you'll see at the bottom, CC live transcript, there is a arrow, click or tap on that arrow and go to hide subtitle. If the type in the live transcript is not large enough for you, click on live transcript, go to subtitle settings, and you'll be able to change the size of the letters there too. So without any more from me, uh, I am going to introduce uh, Sandy Petrosius. She is with the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. And I'm going to ask that if you have any questions for Ordi or Sandy, uh, to please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Take it away, Sandy. Thank you, Matt. And hi, everybody. As uh, Matt said, I'm Sandy Petrosius and I'm the chair of the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum in Waukegan. I'm so happy to be here at the Schomburg Library virtually uh, and so happy that you arrived because we can share your enthusiasm for comics and maybe for Ray Bradbury as well. As uh, Matt said, Ray Bradbury is a very famous and beloved author and he wrote Fahrenheit 451, Martian Chronicles, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Dandelion Wine, over 500 stories, screenplays, theater plays, uh, poems, and a wonderful book of advice to writers as well. Um, and, and each year students throughout the United States uh, meet Ray Bradbury in, grade, in, in middle school and high school and then on to college. And that's all over the United States and abroad as well. So, um, but until now there's been no hometown museum dedicated to Ray Bradbury. So we did open the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum in Waukegan on Ray Bradbury's 100th birthday, which was August 22nd of 2020. Uh, more about that later. But with this museum, students and everyone can experience and get to know Ray Bradbury, his works and his imagination and the way that they can delve right into it. And as we know, one part of Ray Bradbury's growing up was his love of comics, which was engendered right in his home, right in Waukegan. And we're very fortunate tonight to have Ordi Ortwine, uh, whose Ray Bradbury and Comics panel has been uh, really well received at San Diego Comic-Con uh, in San Diego when it 
is going when the pandemic is not interrupting. And, uh, and elsewhere, especially in the Midwest, he presents. So uh, let's jump and get our wings, as Ray Bradbury would say. And now I'll turn it over to Ordy Ortwine. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Let me bring up my screen here. So, all right, then, oops, oop. sorry, this isn't as cool as Ray Bradbury said it would be. Let me try this again. Um, there we go. So my name is Ordi Ortwine, and I'm here to talk about Ray Bradbury and the world of comics. And I represent the Experience Museum, which Sandy will talk more about later. So let's move along. So this story begins in Waukegan, Illinois, which is his hometown. And this is what Bradbury wrote in the 1980 booklet of the San Diego Comic-Con. I have never got over the initial impact of Buck Rogers on my life. And I am grateful for his explosion in my midst sometime in the year 1929, when the newspaper thudded against the screen door of my home in Waukegan, Illinois. So Waukegan had a huge influence on his life and it's really there where the kernel for his writing career began. So anytime you read a story of Bradbury's or a book like Something Wicked This Way Comes that mentions Greentown, Illinois, it's Waukegan that he's thinking of. And he did indeed really like Buck Rogers. So, Right here, as a boy, he obsessively collected his favorite newspaper strips. He scrapbooked them. He filled some 24 scrapbooks with his favorite newspaper comics. This is in the late 1920s. And that box that you're seeing, that is courtesy of something called the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies in Indianapolis. His biographer, John Elder, lives there. And so I actually got, that's my own picture. I got to take that picture and I got to personally handle Ray Bradbury's Boyhood Comics Scrapbooks. So the comics he scrapbooked include Buck Rogers. And again, those are his actual scrapbooks there. And as you can see, uh, Ray Bradbury liked to color them in. These were all black and white originally. He also scrapbooked Tarzan. And you'll notice in the left-hand corner where it says WBBM. So this is definitely from a Chicago area newspaper. And Tarzan, that was by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who also did the John Carter of Mars series of science fiction books, which had a huge influence on Bradbury. And he also collected Flash Gordon. Those were his three mainstays. Now, briefly, as a little boy, Bradbury stopped collecting. And this is why. So, kids made fun. I took on embarrassment and tore up the strips. A month later, empty, I burst into tears asked myself, what was wrong? The answer, Buck Rogers was gone and life not worth living. Damn, I must have cried or darn anyway. And I started collecting Buck Rogers all over again. Since that day, I have never listened to anyone about my tastes. So this is a very important moment for Bradbury. After that point, he just didn't care what people thought about his love of these silly comics and space movies and all things fantastic. He just did what he wanted. And here he wrote further, oops. Without all this splendid mediocrity, this sublime and wondrous trash in my background, I don't think I would be any sort of writer today. So the newspaper comics really begin his fascination with science fiction. You know, realize this is the 20s. There are very few science fiction movies. Comic books don't really exist yet. And even, you know, obviously there's no TV. So Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers was really the first time science fiction is consumed by popular culture. And it had a few huge influence on his writing. <clears throat> so the first time he sort of gets paid by the comics industry comes on the radio. So at age 11, the Bradbury family lived in Tucson, Arizona when he was about 11 years old. And Bradbury was a very bold young man. He actually went to a local radio station and just asked if he could get a job. And this was a different time. They gave this 11-year-old boy a job as an errand boy. And eventually, they let him read the Sunday funnies on the radio. 
and he was paid with movie tickets. He also loved movies. And radio was also a big love of his. And as an adult, as a writer, a lot of his early stories were turned into radio stories on shows like X Minus One and Lights Out. And Bradbury was very enthusiastic about reading comics on the radio. He apparently did funny voices and sound effects. The question has been asked before, are there any recordings of Bradbury reading comics on the radio? Unfortunately, not. I don't think they ever existed. It was not typical for radio stations to make recordings of their own broadcasts. And just so you know, that's not Bradbury in the picture. That's just a stock photo. But reading funnies over the radio was actually a very common thing for radio stations to do at that time. So now the first time Bradbury gets paid as a professional comes under kind of an odd set of circumstances. So this is the May-June 1952 issue of Weird Fantasy from EC Comics. And they ran a story called Home to Stay, which was really an unauthorized mashup of Kaleidoscope and Rocket Man, two of Bradbury's better known stories, especially Kaleidoscope. I won't give away the ending, but the way this comic ends and the way Kaleidoscope ends, it really can't be a coincidence. And this was actually not the first time EC had more or less plagiarized his work. You know, there's the old joke, you know, great artists steal. If that's true, there's a lot of great art in comics at this time. Plagiarism happened all of the time in comics of that era. And there had been other stories that looked a little suspiciously too much like some Bradbury stories. And Bradbury was always defensive of his work. So Bradbury handles this very tactfully. So he wrote a letter to the head of EC Comics, Bill Gaines, and this is what he wrote. Just a note to remind you of an oversight. You have not as yet sent on the check for $50 to cover the use of secondary rights on my two stories. I feel, oops, I feel this was probably overlooked in the general confusion of the office work and look forward to your payment in the near future. So he's very tactful. And Bradbury's letter went on. This is how it ended. Oh, whoops, missed a slide. No. Have you ever considered doing an entire issue of your magazine based on my stories in Dark Carnival or my other two books, The Illustrated Man and The Martian Chronicles? So those are Bradbury's only three books to date and they're all collections of short stories. So he's saying, let's take these books and turn them into an entire book length comic book, what we would now call a graphic novel. This is a very novel idea. And so he's anticipating the graphic novel decades before it would even exist. So that idea was a little too radical for EC Comics. So Bill Gaines replied, although we do not agree with your conclusions, we are enclosing our check for $50 without intending to agree with your contentions. So we didn't do anything wrong, but fine, here's some money. And Gaines goes on, he did not feel that an entire issue devoted to Bradbury was feasible. He even says, the majority of our readers have probably never heard of you, which probably wasn't true. So the idea of a book-length comic book, this is just too far ahead of its time. But they did agree to adapt more of his stories. A total of 27 stories were adapted. These are all issues from various Ray Bradbury adaptations. And as you can see, there are so many, I can't fit them all in one screen. And these were some of Bradbury's best known stories by some of the best known artists of that era. So you have A Sound of Thunder, artwork by Al Williamson, There Will Come Soft Rains, and I love the image there, because if you don't know the story, it happens in the wake of a nuclear holocaust. And I just love the artwork, how you see the images of the children imprinted on the house. And you also notice the long, long dialogue there. Bradbury insisted that a lot of his original writing be included in the adaptations. And Bradbury often wrote letters of praise to the artists directly. And then there's also Mars's Heaven also by Wally Wood. So these are some of the best known stories of his time. 
Now, 16 of these adaptations were later released in two volumes. These are black and white reprints called Tomorrow Midnight and the Autumn People. These are uh, standard paperback size. So in a way, EC Comics would eventually do a graphic novel based on Bradbury. Now, Bradbury came under a lot of pressure to end his reputation with EC Comics for a couple of reasons. So at best, comics were seen as juvenile and beneath real writers, quote unquote. So Bradbury had just recently graduated to the slicks is what they used to call it. And what that meant was for the first part of his career, he's mostly publishing in pulp magazines, you know, like amazing stories and wonder stories and things like that. And those are seen as kind of lowbrow. Something Bradbury struggled with his whole life was being taken seriously as a writer because he wrote that silly science fiction stuff. Well, now finally, he's being discovered by the slicks, by the better paying magazines with a better reputation. So why are you writing comics, Ray Bradbury? This is silly. The world back then does not see comics the way it does now. And interestingly, that, so this magazine, Mademoiselle, this was one of his first slicks that he was published in. And there's a lot of star power in this magazine. So the editor who discovered Bradbury and published this was none other than Truman Capote. And the artwork you see there was done by somebody named Chaz Adams, who did a series of kind of morbid cartoons that would eventually be turned into the TV show, The Addams Family. So I've still never actually seen this magazine in person. I'm trying to get a copy. A lot, of, a lot of star power in that one magazine. Now, at worst, comics were seen as a cause of juvenile delinquency. So this is somebody by the name of, I would say, Frederick Wertham, sometimes Wertham. It depends. He was from Germany, so I tend to go with the German pronunciation. But there he is seen doing what he did best, which is being offended by a comic book. He published this book in 1954, in which he claimed quite seriously that comic books caused juvenile delinquency. And this led to a real hysterical movement against comic books. Among other things, they would literally burn comic books in public squares. This is like 1953, 1954. And you can't really tell, but in the caption there, they point out that this particular comic book burning was organized by the JCs to give you some idea of who's doing this. So civic groups, religious groups, public schools, they oftentimes would organize kids to burn their own comics. And so in this atmosphere, Bradbury slightly acquiesced. He asked that his name be taken off of the covers of the comics. So, you know, there you see his name on the cover of The Haunt of Fear. And actually his was the only writer's name that they put on the cover of comic books. And there it says America's top horror writer or top science fiction writer, you know, whatever they needed him to be. So he wrote a very long apologetic letter, but he did still publish with EC Comics. And he would on in that letter to say, by all means, exploit my stories inside your magazine all that you wish. And there you see on the bottom left, they do indeed have his name adapted from a story by Ray Bradbury. And he would continue to publish with EC Comics until the company folded. So it's worth pointing out that Bradbury was not paid very much for these adaptations. In today's money, it would be about $250. So the smartest thing for him to do would have been to just leave EC altogether, but he doesn't. He sticks with them until the end. And he does this really just out of a childlike glee for comics. Like what I love about Bradbury is he's kind of the first writer to really see comic books the way a lot of us see them now as works of art and something to be a part of. You know, he was proud to be associated with comics, which was not true for everybody at that time. And the end of EC Comics comes very swiftly. So this is a comic book. So there were actually committees, Senate hearings into comic books organized by a well-known senator of the time, Fowler, Key Fowler. And he was an interesting guy. He would run for president. He also ran as vice president. So he has ambitions. And if you've heard of Key Fowler at all, it might be for his 
hearings into organized crime that he did a couple of years earlier. They kind of recreate uh, the Keith Alver hearings in The Godfather 2. So, you know, he's trying to run for president, and I'm guessing that his attack on comics was something he hoped would launch him to the national stage. So they had these televised hearings into comics, and at these hearings, Keith Alver holds up this very comic book, and this comic book is now worth thousands of dollars because of the role it played in comics history. And he holds it up, and they actually had Bradbury's buddy, uh, Bill Gaines, come to testify. And Keith Alver confronts Gaines and says, do you consider this comic book to be in good taste? And Gaines said, yes, that he did. He considered bad taste to be holding the woman's head a little bit higher so you could see the blood dripping out. So that, that did not go well. A lot of people say that Gaines's testimony was worse than the evidence gathered by the good Dr. Vertum. So after that disaster, the comic book industry decided to censor itself over the protests of Bill Gaines. And the comics code in some ways was aimed directly at EC Comics. A lot of others in the comics industry kind of blamed Gaines and EC for you know, sullying the good name of comic books. So they had laws like you couldn't have eerie or weird in any of the titles, and that was a lot of the run of EC Comics, all sorts of things. And for a long time, really until about 1990 or so, a comic book really would not get distribution if it did not have this seal of approval on it. And I should maybe point out this is not a government code per se. It's kind of like the rating system they have in movies. It, the, the comic book industry agrees to censor itself. And under this system, really gains could not survive, except for Mad Magazine. That's the only thing left from the great EC Comics empire. And so just as a fact, the reason it's called Mad Magazine, even though it was a comic book, is because by calling itself a magazine, it did not have to submit to this code. And that's why when I was a kid, you know, Mad Magazine was always sold next to Time and Newsweek because it was technically a magazine and it could get around that code. And Bradbury never forgot this. So decades later, he had his own comic called Ray Bradbury Comics, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But these were adaptations of his stories. And this is what he wrote in the intro to Ray Bradbury Comics number four. So, I was put upon by professional psychologists and social reformers who told us that fantasy was bad for children. One learned professor managed to get quite a few comics banned for many years. And so this is the adaptation that's inside the comic, one of his stories called Usher 2. And Bradbury actually altered it slightly. So these words were not originally in Usher 2 when he published it back in the 50s. Quote, all the tales of terror and fantasy, and for that matter, tales of the future were burned heartlessly. They began by controlling books of cartoons. So this is about 40 years later, but Bradbury has not forgotten. And quite ironically, Vertum's last book, The World of Fanzines, praised of all things comic fanzines. And he even tried to address an audience at the 1974 New York Comic Art Convention, but he was booed off the stage. So speaking of conventions, Bradbury, not long after, goes to the first Comic-Con in 1970. This is the very first Comic-Con San Diego. And only 300 people were in attendance. And that is the schedule that you're seeing from the first Comic-Con. And you can kind of see there, Jack Kirby was also in attendance. So Jack Kirby and Ray Bradbury, lots of fascinating people in one room. All of 300 people went. And he went on to attend Comic-Con San Diego almost every year after. He loved these cons. So that's, I'm going to guess, circa 1980, autographing books. He autographed just about any book you put in front of him. And he really stopped going until his ailing health made it unfeasible. And going back a little bit, he not only went to the first Comic-Con, he went to something called Worldcon way back in 1939. And so that's Bradbury in the striped shirt sitting behind the guy at the wheel. Now, this is now referred to as Worldcon, and it's generally thought of as the great grandfather of all cons, it's more or less the first 
con of its kind. And it still does, it still meets to this day. And they go to a different city every year. And this is where the Hugo Awards are handed out. And the Hugos are kind of the Oscars of science fiction. So Bradbury went to the very first one way back in 1939. And he got there by borrowing money from a good friend of his named Forey Ackerman, because Bradbury's 19, he has no money. So he borrowed the money so he could take the bus and stay at the YMCA. And that's his friend Forey Ackerman on the left with his girlfriend, a woman named Myrtle Douglas. And they are the first people ever to go to a con in costume. So a lot of ground was broken that day. The first cosplayers. And also at Comic-Con, I'm sorry, at Worldcon, Bradbury met somebody named Julius Schwartz, who was on the left. And Schwartz would later be Bradbury's first real agent. He would represent him to something, his agency that had the very cool name of Solar Sales Services. And other clients of Schwartz include Robert Block, he's best known for writing Psycho, and H.P. Lovecraft. And Schwartz would go on to edit DC Comics and he's also generally credited with reviving both Batman and Superman. So a lot of VIPs in that weekend in 1939. Now, another project Bradbury was included in is something called the Halloween tree and its roots begin with Charlie Brown. So Ray saw Schultz's Halloween special, A Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And he was really disappointed that we never get to see The Great Pumpkin. He said it was, quote, like shooting Santa Claus as he comes down the chimney. Now, I mean, I love Ray Bradbury, but I think it kind of would have ruined a Charlie Brown Halloween if Linus had actually seen The Great Pumpkin, but I digress. Now, Bradbury was also good friends with none other than Chuck Jones, who, of course, was famous for his Looney Tunes. And Chuck Jones challenged Bradbury to create a Halloween special of their own. So Bradbury typed up a screenplay, but it was hard getting funding for the project, which gives you an idea of just how hard it is to get a movie made. I mean, Chuck Jones and Ray Bradbury were both very well known at this time at the top of their game, but even they have a difficult time getting funding for the project. And Bradbury had actually also done a painting of, he had done this himself that he dubbed the Halloween tree, and he would work that into the book. Now, the cover art and the interior art was done by a guy named Joe Mugniani. He was a second-generation Italian who would do a lot of the cover art for Bradbury. Bradbury was very particular about who did his art. So unable to publish it to get it made as a movie, Bradbury published it as a standalone novel in 1972. And The Halloween Tree is really, I would say it's really his only book that is for that is specifically YA. Young adults read Bradbury all the time, but The Halloween Tree is the only one that I would say was really specifically for junior high audiences. Now it finally gets turned into a cartoon in 1992. And it was voiced by none other, well, there's two people. So Leonard Nimoy plays the character you see holding the jack-o'-lantern. Carapace Clavicle Mound Shroud. And Mound Shroud is kind of meant to be Bradbury's great pumpkin. And you would never know it's Leonard Nimoy either. It's not his usual baritone voice. He does a great job. And Bradbury narrated the introduction. So if you see this, you will hear Bradbury's voice early on. And it was produced by Hanna Barbera, and it would win an Emmy for Best Animated Children's Program. And I always say, you know, if you're a parent with kids about seven or eight years old and you're a little sick of watching the Charlie Brown special every year, this is a good backup. It's a very overlooked piece. It's very beautifully animated. It's a wonderful story. And Disney actually every year to this day in Disneyland, they decorate a Halloween tree in honor of Bradbury. Bradbury actually had a long professional relationship with Walt Disney. And also in Waukegan last year for the first time, we decorated a Halloween tree and we're hoping to do it again this year. We'll see what happens with the world being the way it is, but hopefully we can do that again. 
And there is the real Halloween tree at Disneyland. And Bradbury was also very active with Disney. He was even consulted to help design the Epcot Center. Now, another animated project Bradbury was involved with is something, and literally, pardon my French, because it's not a language I speak, something called Icarus Montgolfier Wright. And this is an animated short based on Bradbury's story of the same name. And it's about an astronaut dreaming about the history of air travel before he embarks on Earth's first voyage to the moon. So this came out in 1962, before we'd actually landed on the moon. And he predicts that we would land on August 23rd, 1970, and our first trip to Mars as the summer of 1999. So he wasn't too far off with the first one. We're still kind of waiting for the second one. And this was done by his good friend and illustrator that I mentioned before, Joe Mugniani. He spent a year animating this because he created hundreds of watercolors. So it's not totally accurate to call it an animated film. It's a series of watercolors with a voiceover telling the story of this astronaut. And the reason for the title is because they represent different stages of flight. So Icarus is the gentleman who flew too close to the sun. Montgolfier are the guys generally credited with inventing the hot air balloon. And then, of course, there are the Wright brothers who invented flight. And it was nominated for an Academy Award, uh, did not win. And you can see this on YouTube. It's a lot of fun to watch. Now, in the 70s, Bradbury Reese briefly had his own dream of having his own newspaper comic. So the kid who used to hoard newspaper comics was now getting his own. So he tried to get published a newspaper, a Sunday strip of the Martian Chronicles. Now, proofs were drawn up in 1972, and they were done, again, by his good buddy, Joe Mugnani, and someone by the name of Doug Wildley, who did the Johnny Quest cartoon. So it was published in West Magazine, and that was the magazine supplement to the Sunday LA Times. And they ran a full color color version of Mars is Heaven. But that was as far as it went, unfortunately. And then in 1985, DC Comics did a series of adaptations of some very well-known science fiction writers. And they adapted Bradbury's story, Frost and Fire. The illustrations were done by Klaus Janssen. And other authors that DC Comics adapted include Harlan Ellison and George R.R. R. Martin. So that is very good company to be keeping. But it wasn't until the 90s that Ray Bradbury finally realized his dream of having a comic book devoted just to him. So this idea that he suggested way back in the 50s was finally coming true. And it started with, of all things, a video game. So believe it or not, there is a Fahrenheit 451 text-based 80s video game. And you can actually find it online. I've played some of it. And there also was in the 90s a Martian Chronicles video game. And these are both designed by the software developer, Brian Price. And what was unique about the Fahrenheit game especially was that it had images. People of a certain age will find this hard to believe, but those early text-based videos games in the 80s did not always have images. Well, these did. And so he had to hire a team of artists. And the team of artists that he assembled would eventually turn their art into something called the Bradbury Chronicles. And these were a series of graphic novel adaptations of Bradbury's best known writing. They were published by Bantam. And then that was turned into none other than Ray Bradbury Comics. So this is just a standard eight by 10 comic book that ran in the early 90s. And these were published by Topps. And yes, that is the baseball card company. Because in the early 90s, there was kind of an explosion after the first Batman movie came out of companies experimenting with comics. They realized for the first time, wow, we can make a lot of money at this. 
So a lot of companies began experimenting with comics for the first time. And I guess Tops, since they already had children with the baseball cards, decided to experiment with comics. And Tops did a lot of already existing works. They adapted an X-Files comic. They had a Dracula comic. And because they are Tops, every issue of Ray Bradbury comics came with three Ray Bradbury trading cards. Isn't that cool? So every trading card depicted a scene from one of his stories that were adapted in Tops comics. So you see there how it says three exclusive Tops comics right there on the cover. So very cool. I haven't gotten all of them yet. And Topps Comics also did some limited adaptations of both The Martian Chronicles and The Illustrated Man. And again, these are, you know, one-offs. These are standard 8x10 comics, so not, you know, the really thick graphic novels. But due to space limitations, these were only partial adaptations, so they did not adapt all of those books. So the graphic novels would come not too long before his death in 2012. So Ray would see complete graphic novel adaptations of three of his best known works, Fahrenheit 451, The Martian Chronicles, and Something Wicked This Way Comes. And these were published between 2009 and 2011 by a company called Hill and Wang. And Hill and Wang is actually better known for their much more serious books and nonfiction adaptations. So maybe their best known work is an illustrated version of the 9-11 Commission Report. So it gives you an idea of how seriously Bradbury is being taken at this point. So he goes from being this silly science fiction writer to being published by the same guys who did an adaptation of the 9-11 Report. Now, shortly before his death, they conceived this project, and unfortunately, Bradbury would not live to see it published. But there was a book published called Shadow Show. And these were stories written by writers who said that they were inspired by Ray Bradbury, and they, they published stories just for this collection. And you can see here on the left, this is some very good company. So we got Neil Gaiman, Joe Hill, that's Stephen King's son, Margaret Atwood, a lot of well-known writers contributed to this collection. And Sam Weller, the editor, that is one of Bradbury's biographers. And Shadow Show was later adapted as both a graphic, no uh, graphic novel and a comic book. In 2010, Bradbury was one of the recipients of the first generation of something called Comic-Con San Diego's Icon Award. And this is an award that Comic-Con now hands out every year to people who are instrumental in creating greater awareness of and appreciation for comic books and related popular art forms. And that's the award there. And that was unfortunately Bradbury's last Comic-Con he died on June 6, 2012. And I would say nobody really deserved this award more. Some of the other recipients were George Lucas and Neil Gaiman, but I really think, you know, Bradbury, he aligned himself with comics way before it was cool. He defended comics when they were being burned in public squares. And he's really very innovative. He, he really was the first writer to very proudly have his stuff adapted and say, yes, I love comics and this is cool. And that was not a cool thing to say in the 1950s. So he definitely earned this award. And so now this is just a shot of what we hope the Experience Museum will be. And Sandy will talk more about the museum and what we hope to achieve. And just letting you know, that's our website but you can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, wherever cool people are found. So I'll hand it over to Sandy. And hello, everybody. I hope I'm broadcasting okay. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Ordi. There's a lot of connections I'm making in my mind. Uh, now that I hear you again, do your, your presentation and thank you so much for that. Um, uh, yeah, people connect to Ray Bradbury in a lot of different ways. And Ordi just explained to you all these connections and relationships that Ray Bradbury had when he was first starting out, especially getting uh, started with the science fiction uh, club in uh, California. And uh, people were always connecting to him and he was always talking about, he had to feed his hungry imagination. Uh, so let's look a little more at his life and what fueled his hungry imagination. Uh, as you know, Ray Bradbury was born in Waukegan and he called Waukegan Greentown in his story. So you'll see Greentown, Greentown, Illinois, uh, that uh, comes up again and again, most famously in Dandelion Wine. And in one of his stories, he says, or I should say in the book, Zen in the Art of Writing, he says, how did I get from Waukegan, Illinois to Red Planet Mars? How did he get from Illinois, to, uh, Waukegan to Red Planet Mars? Uh, Here's some of the roots of his uh, upbringing and some of the places that meant a lot to him in Waukegan. The Ray Bradbury Experience Museum presents the Greentown Virtual Tour. Come explore Waukegan, Illinois through our immersive map of Ray Bradbury's Greentown as referenced in stories like Dandelion Wine, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Farewell Summer, and more. Visit each historical and literary location and become a witness to the sights and sounds that Ray Bradbury witnessed growing up in Waukegan. Locations include the Carnegie Building, where Bradbury discovered his love for books, the Waukegan Beach, where the carnival came to town, the ravine, where the lonely one once lurked at night, the Waukegan Public Library, original location of Bradbury's elementary school, and Bradbury's childhood home. Visit RayBradburyExperienceMuseum.org for more information. So that was a quick uh, tour. Um, he was born, as we said, in Waukegan on August 22nd, 1920. So what was this town that he was born in that gave rise to uh, so many stories? Was it this idyllic Midwestern hometown? Was it full of magic, horror, dark and shadowy things? Uh, let's look a little bit more at three places that we looked at very quickly in the um, video there. Uh, the ravine. The ravine figures in Ray Bradbury's story, The Whole Town Sleeping. Ray Bradbury um, knew that, uh, remembered that there was the lonely one that was actually a criminal running around town uh, and in those years when he was young and attacking women. Later, he goes on to write this story about the whole town sleeping. The character Lavinia comes up here, which is to the east, and over this hill is where the downtown is, and she decides to go to the movies. Of course, her girlfriends all say, don't do it. The lonely one is out there. She poo-poos them, goes to the movies, and then it's nighttime, and she has to come back down the stairs. And Ray Bradbury's story takes us mysteriously and carefully and slowly down these very stairs, across the bridge, and then up the other set of stairs, which is facing this one to the back of this picture. And then Lavinia approaches her own home with great relief. But that's not the end of the story. Ray Bradbury put this and many stories into Dandelion Wine, which is the um, really a compilation of many of his short stories that are autobiographical and uh, is one of his most famous books. Uh, Ray Bradbury did come back to town and one of the times he came back to town was in the 1960s. He went to Ray Bradbury Park and he visited it. And in, uh, already mentioned a comic that's called the Bradbury Chronicles, uh, 
This is a book that is Sam Weller's biography of Ray Bradbury called The Bradbury Chronicles, but this is a biography. Sam Weller is one of his biographers um, and he is from Columbia College in Chicago, Illinois. In that book, he talks about the visit that Ray Bradbury made to Waukegan. He goes back to this park, he climbs a tree and he finds a note that he wrote to himself and the note ends with, I remember you, I remember you. This is very strange and mysterious that a boy would write to his older self, plant the note in the tree and say, I remember you. But Ray Bradbury said that was his note and it really shines a light on Ray Bradbury's love of time travel, his fascination with going time going back and forth. He uh, said he remembered his own birth. Uh, this is now Ray Bradbury Park. It was dedicated in 1990. And of course, Ray Bradbury came back to town for that big celebration. There were several events commemorating him. And then in uh, as recently as March 16, 2019, uh, United for Libraries um, made a national literary landmark out of Ray Bradbury Park. And, that day we had uh, Illinois Reads was uh, centered in Waukegan with a special tribute to Ray Bradbury. And actually, uh, since we're talking with, in, on behalf of Schomburg Library, uh, I just got an email yesterday from people at uh, the National Libraries and they are going to publish in their American Libraries magazine uh, for the American Library Association they're publishing a story on American on literary landmarks and Ray Bradbury Park will be included in that. Uh, and that of course, anybody can come and visit this. This park is right near where Ray Bradbury's home was in Waukegan. It's across the street from his boyhood home and his grandparents' home. Both of those homes figure in Ray Bradbury's stories. Both of those homes are privately owned. Another, very significant item in Ray Bradbury's life was the historic Carnegie Library, the library he went to. Now, this library, if you go straight east of the park we just looked at, at 1 North Sheridan Road and Washington Street, you will find the Carnegie Library. This library was uh, 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 very interesting. I'll take you through just the uh, origin of the library at this point. Um, it was one of the Carnegie libraries that was so frequently built by Andrew Carnegie in the uh, early 1900s. This one is, was in 1903. This one was unusual because it was positioned on Lake Michigan, right above Lake Michigan on the bluff that goes all the way across the east side of Waukegan. And it has five stories. Uh, you enter on the ground level here. There's a big mezzanine for the reading room, the adult reading room. And then you go down the stairs to the children's reading room. And then in the back here, uh, the, the windows look out on Lake Michigan and it cascades down the bluff into five stories. As you see right now, it's vacant and it has very good bones. It's a very great structured building. It's been empty for many years, but the good news is uh, the Waukegan Park District has recently purchased it and from the city and it will become a Waukegan History Center with a tribute area to Ray Bradbury. Now switching to what it meant to Ray Bradbury when he uh, was probably thinking of uh, writing his stories. Um, something Wicked This Way comes. If you've seen the movie or read the book, the scene in there with uh, the boys, uh, with um, uh, Will and his father and Jim Nightshade and Mr. Dark, they all get into the library. And I can just see Ray Bradbury imagining this very library for that scene. Uh, so Ray Bradbury just celebrates libraries. He says they fueled all of my curiosity from dinosaurs to ancient Egypt. 
he didn't get to go to college. So when he was in grad, uh, in California, he said, when I graduated from high school in 1938, I began going to the library three nights a week. I did this every week for almost 10 years. Uh, and finally, in 1947, about when I got married, I figured I was done. So I graduated from the library and that I found was the real school. So it's now under renovation. That would be another point of interest for people who come to Waukegan to see more about Ray Bradbury. Another very exciting development is the creation of this sculpture, Fantastical Traveler. Um, its title is Fantastical Traveler, much like the man himself, brilliant and bursting with creative energy. Uh, this statue of Ray Bradbury was created by sculptor Zachary Oxman. It stands in front of the Waukegan Public Library, which uh, I think already mentioned is the site of Central School where Ray Bradbury went to grade school, which now of course has the new library uh, after the Carnegie became too small. Uh, look at the statue, it's, it's made in a DIY, uh, do-it-yourself kind of style because we all know that Ray Bradbury was not interested in the technical side or the scientific side of, of rockets. You just got into your rocket and went. And uh, we've got a mask on him right now and he's holding up a book and he's very enthusiastic about taking the rocket. Uh, it was dedicated on August 22nd of nine, 2019, which was Ray Bradbury's 99th birthday. And uh, the inscription on the statue is, if only we had taller been. Now this honor came to Ray Bradbury after he had died. It, it came, he died in 2012. And as already mentioned, some of the awards that Ray Bradbury won in his lifetime, uh, this honor and so many awards, uh, how would Ray Bradbury have taken all this acclaim? Uh, just to preview, uh, let's remember not only the awards that Ray uh, already mentioned, but he was honored with the National Book Award Lifetime Achievement, Emmys, Hugos, and many others uh, honored with this statue. In outer space, Ray Bradbury has Dandelion Crater named after him on the moon. Uh, he has a Bradbury landing on Mars named after him and asteroid, Bradbury asteroid 966, 9677. All three of those are in outer space named for Ray Bradbury. Well, how seriously did he take himself? Uh, on November 12th, 1971, uh, Ray Bradbury and uh, the famous uh, Carl Sagan, the planetary scientist, the famous Arthur C. Clarke, the astronomer, I mean, the uh, science fiction writer, got together because Mariner 9 mission, mission had reached Mars. Uh, it was the day before Mariner had reached Mars. And they began uh, to talk on this panel about the future of space exploration and the perennial spirit of discovery. So I'll let you watch this and decide how Ray Bradbury looks at himself as a creator and, and the winner even at that time of awards. And then at the end, you'll hear him recite his own poem that is inscribed on the statue. I don't know what in hell I'm doing here. Uh, I'm the least scientific of all the people up on the platform here today. Um, Nine-year-old boys are always finding me out. <laughs> Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh. A 10-year-old boy a few years ago ran up to me and he said, is that Mr. Bradbury? I said, yes. He said, that book of yours, The Martian Chronicles? I said, yes. He says, on page 92, <laughs> he says, where you have the moons of Mars uh, rising in the east. I say, yes. He said, no. I 
closer to Mars and the dust cleared, we see a lot of Martians standing there with huge signs saying Bradbury was right. <laughs> Well, even Clark. <laughs> so, and I have brought along today, I'm going to keep this short because I'd much rather listen to our scientific friends here today tell us about what's coming up this week. But I, every time I get a group of people together and have them trapped in a hall like this, I bring a poem, see? And you can't escape me. <laughs> Luckily, it's a short poem, but it sums up some of my feelings on why I love space travel, why I write science fiction, why I'm intrigued with what's going on this weekend on Mars. And part of this has my philosophy about space travel. And if you'll permit, I'll read it to you. It's very, very short. The fence we walked between the years did balance us serene. It was a place half in the sky where in the green of leaf and promising of peach, we reach our hand to touch and almost touch the sky. If we could reach and touch, we said, it would teach us not to, never to, be dead. We ate and almost touched that stuff. Our reach was never quite enough. If only we had taller been and touched God's cuff, his, his hem, we would not have to go with them who've gone before, who, short as us, stood tall as they could stand, and hoped by stretching tall that they might keep their land, their hope, their heart their flesh and soul, but they, like us, were standing in a hole. O oh, Thomas, will a race one day stand really tall across the void, across the universe and all, and measured out with rocket fire, at last put Adam's finger forth, as on the Sistine ceiling, and God's hand come down the other way to measure man and find him good and gift him with forever's day? I worked for that. Short man, large dream. I send my rockets forth between my ears, hoping an inch of good is worth a pound of years. Aching to hear a voice cry back along the universal mile. We've reached Alpha Centauri. We're tall. Oh, God, we're tall. So maybe that answers for you the initial question that we asked, which was Ray Bradbury asking, how did I get from Waukegan to Red Planet Mars? Maybe it was his dream of being tall that he created more and more as he went through his writing. Uh, actually, this group here, a year later, um, they got together uh, and looked at uh, images of the Red Planet that were taken by Mariner 9. And they put together the images and, a, and a, some afterthoughts with this three men. And uh, they published the book, Mars and the Mind of Man, which is available still today. And if you go to Waukegan and you uh, look at the statue, you can read the poem, If Only We Had Taller Been inscribed there. So as I said, Ray Bradbury meant different things to different people. To some, he meant the comics, the fantasy of the circuses, uh, time travel, Mexico, uh, freedom of expression, ravines, family, Mars, love, space travel, so many different things. Uh, and as we went through developing the museum, people would come to us and say, uh, I met Ray. And uh, they would tell us how they personally were affected by him, and yet they were different avenues, entry points like you. Some of them were very interested in comics, and some had entry points that were different, and they wanted those shown. So let's start out with this one. Uh, Faith Clark, she uh, talks about how Ray never forgot her hometown, and he gives her something that she treasures. Now, as you watch this, uh, just uh, notice that this is the setting of Bowen Park in Waukegan, which is the annual uh, site of the annual Dandelion Wine Festival. So here's Faith. Hi, my name is Faith Clark. I have lived in Waukegan 50 years. Came here with my husband, Hank, to work in the Waukegan school system. 
when we came here, I was so excited about all the different cultural things that were available. I'd grown up in a family that always loved science fiction anyway. So, you know, I, I knew about Ray Bradbury from reading his um, works when I was young. And to be in a town that he had been involved with was pretty exciting. As I continued on in my career, first I was in a, a magnet grade school and then moved to kind of a fine arts middle school. And I was so excited because it was right in the neighborhood where Ray Bradbury had lived as a child. Now, how did I know that? Well, that was because when we first came to town, the cultural arts department of the park district did a wonderful thing. They had a tour of the town, the cultural things, and they told us all about uh, Ray Bradbury's childhood and connection and about how the book Dandelion Wine was all about Waukegan. And on that, uh, on that tour, they actually handed out a map and the map was something that um, Ray had drawn for one time when he came to town. And the first time I probably met Ray was when he came for a series of plays they were doing based on some of his radio scripts. So what I did was I took Ray's map and then I created this map, which became our walking map. And on it, I marked all the things in the book that we would be able to still see they were still in our town. And so what I did then was I annotated uh, what all the sites were, all of the places that we were walking to. I listed them on a second page and put the page numbers of the book right where they could find them. The reason it meant so much to me was I thought we have to find things in life that we can share together. And how wonderful we have the legacy of this man that never forgot us, never forgot our town. Hi, my name is. Right, he never did forget his town. And we have a lot of evidence of that. Um, but what's another entry point for Ray Bradbury with other people? Ray did spend time in East Los Angeles. He did travel to Mexico and it, it did influence his writing. Um, let's hear from this Waukegan resident who didn't expect to learn something new about a local author. There was a storytelling festival here at the Genesee Theater. I attended the storytelling uh, festival and there was a local author from the area, from the Chicago area, uh, Megan Wells. And she performed a reading of one of Ray Bradbury's stories uh, from Dandelion Wine. It was called Calling Mexico. And that's the first time that I actually discovered uh, Ray's talent and um, his relatability uh, because she read the story. She did an amazing job reading it. And but what struck me the most was the style of writing, um, the way it was expressed. Um, I, it, 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 help me feel uh, what what the man in the story is going through. Um, and it really awoken a, an interest in Ray Bradbury and me uh, from that time, especially because I personally am of uh, Mexican descent. So um, I had no idea that Ray Bradbury had such a love for the Mexican culture. It was really eye-opening. I knew he was a local author. I knew you know, that he was very celebrated here. And I don't think I opened up until I had that experience uh, to read more of his work uh, because, like I said, it really struck a chord with me where I related because I, I've been, you know, to Mexico, and I, but I haven't been there since I was a child. So to me, um, when, when he's describing Mexico, it's almost like I'm there. It's almost like I'm living it. And that's how, how come I could tell that Ray Bradbury's uh, love of Mexico is genuine because of the vivid way he described it and how much I could picture it myself when, when it was being read. So Ray Bradbury um, uh, does, uh, this is Topacio Hernandez, a Waukegan resident. And you heard her very, very sincere expression of how Ray Bradbury understood a Mexican culture. When he went to Mexico, he wrote a book, uh, really a novelette called Next in Line. And it uh, connects to uh, uh, 
uh, The Mummies of Guanajuato, and uh, it's published in a book of photographs. He wrote The Wonderful Ice Cream Suit with um, uh, James, Ed that became a Disney movie with James Edward Olmos, Joe Mantegna, and Isai Morales, where uh, these four guys in, in uh, East LA decide that they will win their heart's content, their dream, if they could just wear that white suit that's in the haberdasher store. And they do manage to chip in and buy it. And each one goes out one night to uh, realize his dream. Another story is I See You Never, which is a, a man who's an immigrant and he lives in a boarding house, gets up and goes to work every day and uh, lives a very quiet life and is very beloved in his little community. But one day there's a knock at the door and the immigration services come. So this was written a long time ago. Uh, we, I just wanna mention also, already mentioned that the uh, story that, that he took a stand on comic books very early in his career. Uh, Ray Bradbury not only wrote these stories about the Mexican culture, but he took stands on racial justice. Uh, stories that weren't really published in the 50s because the publishers didn't think they would um, be accepted, but we can find them today. Uh, one of them that's quite famous is called The Big Black and White Game. And I mean, the, I'm gonna tell you about four stories and they're set in, in these different places. This one is set right above our border here of Wisconsin at, at the Illinois border where Ray Brent as a little boy when his dad went to the resort as a guest of the electric company that employed him, they would send the workers there for a little outing at the resort in Delavan. And uh, so this story Ray witnessed as a boy was about the white resort uh, people who are attending the resort for fun and the black workers who are working at the resort have a baseball game. And the characters are very strong. The situation is very strong and it speaks to, um, to civil uh, justice in a way that's really ahead of its time. It was also his first uh, realistic fiction and he got praised for the way he described the baseball game like a sports writer. Um, Another one is set in the South. It's uh, the transformation. And it's very difficult for me to describe this, but something very horrible happens to an African-American woman. And uh, Ray Bradbury uh, decides that uh, at the hands of a white man, but it turns out to be that Ray Bradbury chooses white characters to establish some justice and the ending of the story is purely Bradbury and I won't reveal it. Um, Chrysalis is another story where Ray Bradbury spent time on the beach in California. This story is about an African-American boy and a white boy who become friends on the beach. And they start talking about skin color because the, the white boy is trying to get a tan and the African-American boy is having a lot of discrimination trouble. He's trying to get white. And uh, the story proceeds from there. Um, and finally, the, uh, there's more, but the, uh, the other foot is set on Mars where uh, African-Americans from uh, Earth travel to Mars to establish a new colony so they will be free. But then a group of white people are escaping the wars on planet Earth and the African-American colony on Mars must decide how they will treat this new group of people. So uh, Ray Bradbury did address these things. We don't hear about this much. We're always hearing about science fiction, but that is another avenue to there enjoy Ray Bradbury. There was a storytelling festival here at the Genesee Theater. Um, another one is a story of Dominic and Jenna, and I'll just let you hear this one. Uh, when we got married, uh, we engaged. were engaged. Time to get engaged. Uh, I 
to ask her uh, on the steps of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I got a copy of the Martian Chronicles because, as the story goes, when um, Ray was meeting someone from lunch there, he was coming through Chicago, he, um, they came out from lunch from the Art Institute and he was swarmed on those steps by other fans in Chicago, and that's when Ray knew that he had found his mark as a writer and found an audience. And I wanted Jenna to know that with Jenna, I had found love in my life, and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. So um, I had tied in, since we had met over a conversation with Ray Bradbury, I wanted to mark our wedding proposal with Ray Bradbury. Since meeting John, I was inspired to go into literacy. I work uh, with an organization that um, takes donated books and uh, gives them to kids to support reading and writing programs. Um, and just to show the magic of Ray and donated books, um, one day while going around the used bookstore, now keep in mind, for disclosure, this is not my used bookstore, but I was going around another used bookstore. This is me in my 40s, but I found someone had donated a copy that I gave them when I was in high school, and this is in good condition. Uh, this is, I lent it to someone when I was in high school. I found this like in my 30s or 40s. This is like my handwriting. I found this in another used bookstore. <laughs> It came back to me, one of Ray's books. Um, and I think it's a great testament to the way that um, our story begins really with a great conversation about Ray Bradbury. And he keeps coming back into our lives in a myriad ways. So that is a really cute story that uh, is unexpected. Uh, and I just wanna mention, keep in mind that that story about the Art Institute where Ray they mentioned he went to visit somebody for lunch at the Art Institute. He actually is visiting a fan who has corresponded with him. So Ray's coming through town very briefly. He agrees to meet a fan with whom he's been corresponding for lunch at the, at the Art Institute. And that comes into something we want to talk about later. Um, uh, then, uh, how do we, uh, what's another avenue for connecting with Ray Bradbury? Uh, we... um, Michael Hathaway uh, owns a brew pub in downtown Waukegan in the heart of the downtown, not a stone's throw from the library where you saw the fantastical traveler. Um, he named his brew pub Nightshade and Darks. And Nightshade, of course, is Jim Nightshade, who was the, one of the boys in Something Wicked This Way Comes. And of course, Mr. Dark brings the evil to town in, uh, Nightshade, in, in Something Wicked This Way Comes. And Michael shares with you his pathway to understanding Ray Bradbury. So listen. One of the first things I found out about this area when I moved up here was it was Ray Bradbury's hometown. And it kind of sunk in the green town was, was Waukegan and I was fascinated with him. I had been a fan of his for I'm 51 now. I've been a big fan of his since I was 30, but I've been exposed to his work a lot. When I was in seventh grade, they made us read the Martian Chronicles. And I realized when I was 30 and reread it again that I didn't get any of it when I was that young. And then when I went back and read it when I was in my 30s, I realized that the stories weren't supposed to be about Mars. They, they weren't science fiction. They were supposed to be about people and us. And a lot of it was analogous for things that had happened on Earth. And he put them in sharp relief by making them happen between humans and Martians instead of humans and American Indians or humans and, the, and Caribbean or Polynesian natives. And I was kind of astonished by the prescience of some of his stories about race relations. There's a story called And the Rock Cried Out where Europe, the United States, and Russia nuke each other, and the rest of the world jumps for joy and parties, and all of a sudden, the few remaining Americans in the world are minorities who get mistreated everywhere they go. And he wrote that in the 50s, during the Cold War era, and that's exactly the way it, it, it's, it's felt now around the world. There's a lot of the world really dislikes us and would jump for joy if we blew up tomorrow. 
And realizing that he understood that that long ago made me a big fan. And I went back and revisited all, all the material. So those are people who met or were influenced by Ray Bradbury. And after we had done so much uh, talking to people, we decided, well, where is the hometown museum? There's so much here, we need a hometown museum. Let me just give you a little background. Um, Ray Bradbury's house, uh, Ray Bradbury dies in 2012. This house uh, was the main house in Los Angeles area, uh, the neighborhood called Cheviot Hills. Um, this house is the one that has the basement office that he worked in and he wrote so many of his stories there. The famous desk that's loaded with uh, uh, artifacts and, and action figures and every little thing that he picked up uh, to give him inspiration. Uh, when Ray did, they did the uh, uh, Bradbury Theater TV show, they started out every program with Ray walking into, it was a replica, but it was supposed to be this very desk that he uses every day. Uh, so that house and the garage that was full of his books and stuff um, was sold after his death and the uh, new owner decided to tear it down. And uh, those are some pictures of how it went down. Uh, we called it stucco dandelion yellow and uh, we do have an exam, we do have a piece of his house. Uh, and uh, so what happened to all of his artifacts and archives? Uh, there's a movie, uh, a video of a truck leaving that goes to Indiana University where um, Ordy mentioned that he handled the box of Ray Bradbury's uh, comics from when he was a boy. Indiana University with Professor Jonathan Eller the, who is the other biographer of Ray Bradbury, uh, who just completed his third volume of his biography this last year. Um, the truck went there. The other truck with Ray Bradbury's personal library went to Waukegan, Illinois, to the Waukegan Public Library, 350 boxes of his personal library books. Uh, and his boyhood home in Waukegan, as you know, is privately owned. So we decided to uh, try to open the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum and we called it Experience because we knew we wouldn't be a typical artifact museum. We thought we would engage students and people and all our visitors in the ideas of Ray Bradbury, the stories of Ray Bradbury, his universal themes. Even though there was the pandemic and our fundraising was slowing down dramatically, we didn't, we lost, uh, a lot of time. We did open on August 22nd. Here we people are visiting and seeing our future plans for the museum. Uh, in this slide, you're seeing Ordy talking to people about the um, uh, comic books and Comic-Con, and we have movie posters of all the movies he made. Uh, here we're looking at uh, Fahrenheit 451 that is serialized in three, the second, third, and fourth issue of Playboy. And what was the connection? Well, Hugh Hefner, uh, his uh, Fahrenheit 451 was coming out in 1953 in October, and Hugh Hefner's Playboy was about to come out in December. And of course, there was a lot of objection to uh, Hugh Hefner and Playboy and uh, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 dealt with uh, suppression of expression and censorship. And so uh, the two of them got together and became friends. And as I said, uh, his, the whole Fahrenheit 451 is serialized. Uh, we also had mur have murals uh, of the mechanical hound in Fahrenheit 451. And here, this gentleman who is from Argentina is looking at the Mummies of Guanajuato, uh, which is a 1978 book, which has reprinted Ray Bradbury's novelette, The Next in Line. And the, the photographs are from uh, Archie Lieberman. Uh, that day, uh, the city of Waukegan uh, did not 
fulfill its power. All of us, we were planning for the celebration of the 100th birthday of Ray Bradbury and the large celebration couldn't happen. We took visitors by reservation. But if you remember where Ray Bradbury Park was and uh, the Carnegie Library, which is just a couple of uh, buildings away from uh, where this picture is, uh, they, they officially named that stretch of uh, about a half mile as Ray Bradbury's Greentown Walkway, W-A-U-K-W-A-Y, and uh, then brought the sign over to us in celebration of that wonderful day. Um, what are we doing next? Well, next we are creating a couple of new exhibits that we hope to get up as soon as we can in the next few months. One of them uh, will be about the drive to create. Uh, Ray Bradbury was always used typewriters. Um, his famous story is that he typed the final version of Fahrenheit 451, renting a typewriter at UCLA. Their library had typewriters you can rent. He paid a dime for every half an hour. And I think I know already knows the exact, but something like he said he spent $9.80 to write uh, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Ray Bradbury uh, was distrustful of, uh, of uh, technology that he wanted to warn people about that. So this exhibit will tell about Ray's development as a writer. Uh, it will also show the original typewriter, the dial a, a, a word, a letter typewriter that he got when he was in Arizona, already talked about him being in Arizona and uh, writing and copying uh, dialogue from uh, comics by typing on that little typewriter. Then this exhibit that we're going to show is going to be uh, about the correspondence that between Ray Bradbury and so many of his fans that we have received. L letters that show his memories of Waukegan, his memories of boyhood, encouragement to writers, travels to Europe, uh, they're full of warmth, full of excitement about life. Uh, the future of our BEM is, and our mission is to inspire imagination and foster free thinking and creativity through engagement in the universal themes and timeless works of Ray Bradbury. And here's a little bit about our future plans. Welcome to the world of Ray Bradbury. This is the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. Imagine a space where all of his stories came alive. Science fiction, fantasy, and the American dream. Imagine a place where the future is present to our youth and to our educators and Ray Bradbury fans across the globe. The Ray Bradbury Experience Museum will open in Bradbury's hometown of Waukegan, Illinois and be accessible around the world through our virtual museum or real-time interface for online audience engagement. Every room comes to life when you become a character in your favorite story. From Fahrenheit 451, to the Martian Chronicles, Dandelion Wine, to Something Wicked This Way Comes. Our interactive displays will allow you to step into a dystopian future where you choose which books will be saved and which books will be burned. You can wander into a dark carnival and feed into your deepest desires. We hope to engage you with a learning environment that brings ideas of fantasy, adventure, nostalgia, and dreams of space to life. We hope to take you on a journey through the mind of one of the greatest American writers of our time. Expand your horizon and experience the adventures of Ray Bradbury. So, welcome to the, the world of Ray Bradbury. Uh, the this museum is the will have, uh, we're looking at uh, six main exhibit areas and these icons represent them. The Martian Chronicles area, which will be about his stories about not just the Martian Chronicles, but about space travel and uh, travel back and forth into time. 
uh, Baron Bora Height 451 represented here, which will be about uh, freedom of expression and uh, censorship, and also about uh, he stood up during the McCarthy era. So uh, that was another freedom of expression issue. Um, something wicked, the dark side, the horror side, the dandelion wine area, which will be uh, about his uh, love of libraries, his nostalgia for home and boyhood and fatherhood relationships. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, what did I miss? Um, inspired, well, Life of Ray Bradbury too, of course. And then Inspired by, uh, there are so many writers. In fact, the book I mentioned, the Bradbury Chronicles, uh, each of the chapters in this book starts out with a quote from somebody who usually is very famous, like Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, Neil Gaiman, Margaret Atwood, uh, 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 Ursula Le Guin, and many others expressing, what, and Stanley, Stanley, who you would know, uh, who expressed uh, their admiration and, 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 and how, how much Ray Bradbury meant to them. So, so many people were influenced by him. And, uh, and finally, um, Ray Bradbury had many um, warnings. He said he came not to uh, predict the future, but to prevent it. And he had dark warnings, but he was basically a very, very positive person. And these are some quotes we have telling about all the positive things that he uh, believed in and their he encouraged writers in all of his letters that he constantly wrote back to people uh, with these kinds of encouragement. So finally, you can connect with us on our website. Uh, we have wonderful YouTubes that you would be really interested in. Um, uh, the uh, people like, um, excuse me, people like David uh, Ebenbach, How to Mars and Steve Darnell and John, uh, Joe R. Lansdale, visit the YouTube. There's good interviews there and all the rest of our um, places where you can visit us. If you go to our website, you can sign up for our e-newsletter and we would love to hear from you that way and you can keep in touch with us. Thank you very much. Matt? All right, well, thank you, Sandy and Ori. We have a few minutes for questions here. Type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to start with a comment from Bill. Bill says, regarding video games, Byron Price was a book editor and packager. I doubt he wrote a single line of code, but probably made the deal to license Bradbury's work for the game, hired programmers, and put his name on the box. So there's okay. a little... I guess that's something to speak about with them. Price developed several video games, so... Maybe software developer is not the most accurate phrase, but he produced a lot of video games as well as produced a lot of books. So, Indeed. but yeah, that's a good point. All right, our next question comes from Adrian. They write, did Bradbury have any interest in manga and anime? Not that I know of specifically. Like if you see the Halloween tree, I wouldn't say that's manga, but it's, or anime, but I mean, some of the style perhaps could be considered that, but I. I know he went to Dragon Con quite a bit, so he probably was at least exposed to it, but I don't know of any, like, there's no like adaptation that I know of that would be considered in that genre or those genres. Mm, all right. Uh, this question is from Alex. Alex asks, are you considering an area on the Halloween tree? I watched the cartoon as a child and always enjoyed it. Uh, an area as in what? Um, I believe in the museum, were... I'm sure that the Halloween tree will uh, come out in, in the area uh, of, of one of the areas. Yes, that's a great question. Yeah, they we're not sure about doing the Halloween tree this year. We hope to, but it's just because of the world we live in. But it would definitely be a neat idea. Yeah, I, I think what already is speaking of is that in downtown Waukegan, they yeah, did have yeah. a, a Halloween tree. But I think the question was regarding the, the actual museum, uh, I think, and that, uh, that would be a, a place, yes. Uh, right now, we're trying to focus on the Martian Chronicles area and the Fahrenheit 451 area for fundraising. 
Wonderful. All right, we have one more comment here. It's from Bill. Uh, Bill says, I met Ray too in an elevator. We had a brief but memorable conversation. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> well, Bill, we would love to hear from you and hear your story as well. Um, uh, congratulations. And I, I have to say, after everything I've read and the people have connected with us, Ray Bradbury was a connector. Even when he was in Arizona and uh, got that toy typewriter, this was when he... His folks moved to Arizona to try to get a job. His dad was out of a job. They only stayed there for a couple of years and then they went back to Waukegan. Then they went to California and that's where they stayed. But uh, he got that little toy typewriter, the dial a letter, and he did copy uh, dialogue from the comics, but he also typed letters back to his folks or his relatives in Waukegan. And, and I thought, what a fit, because the, if, you, if you wrote to him, he wrote back and that, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but that um, uh, about the type, uh, about the uh, correspondence exhibit in uh, Sam Weller's book, he, he asked Ray Bradbury, how can you respond to all those letters you get? You get 300 letters a week. And Ray Bradbury said, if it's a love letter, you have to write back. I think that's a good place to end that. That's a really great quote. I love right. it. Well, thank you once again to Ordi and Sandy for sharing with us all this great knowledge about Ray Bradbury. Thank all of you for attending and uh, everyone have a great night. We'll see you next yeah. time. Thank you.